So yeah, as she said, I am Brian Seeley. Um, for anyone who missed the last one or didn't bother to watch the recording, I'm with you. I wouldn't have either. The I am a cybersecurity expert. I do ethical hacking. Uh, I was a U.S. Marine for a bit. I wiretapped the Secret Service and the FBI, which is the smartest and dumbest thing I've ever done. Um, and I was married once, so that's that puts that into context. <laughs> Strategic advisor at a company called Spire Solutions. That's fairly new. They are a company out of uh, and value added reseller out of Dubai. They pay me to fly over there and speak on their behalf at conferences. Uh, I also spoke and helped found a conference in Saudi Arabia uh, promoting, it's like DEF CON or Black Hat in Las Vegas, um, put together by some of the same people. And I was one of the I was the top build speaker at the event. I got to meet some of my heroes and help put together the event and do some live streaming and helping them figure out how to modernize and bring um, hacking culture to Saudi Arabia to be able to defend against people who are gonna try and attack them. And we are the sort of the tip of the spear on that. We all have English operating systems, so people aren't hacking Japan or China as easily as they are able to hack us because everyone speaks English. We don't all speak Chinese yet. So uh, I do webinars like this, training, uh, mainly on cybersecurity and hacking. I think I'm underqualified uh, in a variety of other subjects. I don't think anyone's beating down my door for harmonica repair lessons. I advised John McAfee on his, I was on his board for a few years uh, before he passed away. And I'm an amateur father. I think that just means I don't get paid. I would lose my professional or amateur status and would no longer be able to compete. So instead of the why I wiretap the Secret Service introduction, which usually is what everyone wants to hear, but you guys have already heard that, I can get right into better content. Some of the biggest breaches that have happened in the past few months, not including the anonymous hacks within the Russia-Ukraine conflict, which is a whole other talk, and it's just fascinating because, I mean, they hack their spy satellites and space agency. Like, that's just cool. Um, it gives that whole, have you, anybody seen Moonfall, the movie, yet in theaters or whatever? Well, there's a really handsome astronaut, and then there's Halle Berry, and then there's sort of a conspiracy theorist neckbeard computer guy who manages to tag along into space because he discovered all this by being a super geek. That made me happy because now the likelihood is going up that I get to go to space. Obviously not as the handsome astronaut. Unfortunate, but we don't get to pick. HubSpot was hacked by an organization, um, an employee, had their account compromised. This employee does customer support within HubSpot. They weren't actually targeting HubSpot. It was a, a jumping off point. That employee's support account and computer, they have a designated computer for doing support for customers. And it only has a certain window of time that it's actually able to interact with customer uh, accounts, was hacked. And then customers that were related to cryptocurrency were targeted. So people aren't making direct attacks on Fort Knox. They're going for the janitor. They're going for the cleaning lady. They're going for any way to plant some sort of um, like a Trojan horse, essentially. Microsoft was hacked by the same people. Uh, the, the group is called Dev, D E. B0537. And they have a, a more pronounceable name called Lapsus. Uh, they're out of organized out of um, Europe, Ukraine, uh, mostly in the UK. I think a couple of people in Brazil and they're teenagers. The so called ringleader is 16. He was arrested. He's supposed to be a multimillionaire. And people did always say that you'd learn stuff from kids. Uh, 
I don't think this is what they meant, but um, I'll take it. Microsoft was breached, but not in a significant way. No customer data, no, um, all that, all they lost was 90% of the source code for Bing and a few other products, like 40 gigabytes of source code. And they were posting in a Telegram group about how they were breached. They breached Microsoft. So Microsoft was able to go and find out and figure out where large amounts of data were coming out of and shut it down. So they celebrated too early. Okta was another really big one. For those who don't know what it is, it is like Microsoft Azure AD. It is an identif uh, identity service that allows for like single sign-on. So whenever you go to a website, it's like, you wanna sign in with Facebook or Google or PayPal or whatever, that means your identity is being checked by this other service and they hold the truth, whether you are that person or not. And so it's outsourcing a very difficult, potentially risky, and obviously we can see why, um, part of online uh, transactions. So Okta was breached. They found out because Lapsus posted on Telegram again, 2.5% of their customers were exposed. The federal government uses Okta for identity. Um, so it was fairly serious and Okta was downplaying some of the claims and they responded. Um, they ended up breaking into their Slack channel or a Slack app and commented that they have eight, 0.6 thousand channels. And in Slack, they found encryption keys, private keys for AWS, like attached as files. Now we're all engineered, we've all cut corners and we've all sent files to somebody, but in chat where it stays saved forever, um, that's bad, that's a bad idea. And the fact that no one had permission limitations at all to have to, um, everyone could see all the channels. That, that's also a really bad idea. So they called them out on that. And I think, I don't have a confirmation on it, but a couple companies reported that when they broke into Okta, they broke in through their customer support company that was outsourced, it's called Cytel. So they're a, this is a supply chain attack. So they broke in using this, uh, like a janitorial service for a company and they found huge spreadsheets of usernames and passwords in Excel, which is a really big no-no if you're a regular company. But if you're a company that should know better, who writes the book on how not to do that, and then you do that, particularly embarrassing. It, it, I don't know, it's like getting caught with drugs and being an anti-drug congressman or being getting caught with an underage boy and being anti-gay. Like, it's just very like, oh man, you couldn't have seen this coming? Really? A bad one, January 22. $30 million, crypto.com, 483 accounts were not hacked, but there was an incident and Ethereum and Bitcoin and a bunch of other things were stolen because they were able to bypass the two-factor MFA and we don't know how. I don't think they're going to disclose that because it hasn't been fixed yet and they don't want uh, to be giving like a playbook to people. Flexbooker, the hacker group known as UA Wrong Team. Man, like they need branding or marketing, somebody to like coach them through this because this is just embarrassing. They stole 3 million users' data, credit cards, driver's licenses, personal identifications, so all current credit cards, all their billing addresses and everything that kind of goes along with it socials, 
and sold it on dark market places. So that's fun. Uh, the Cash App. They filed an SEC filing saying we got hacked, we're fixing it, don't ask questions. So that's all we know. Twitch is an Amazon product. It is a streaming video game service. So people go and watch people play video games. Apparently the source code was leaked. Still no word on why people would watch other people play video games. I still haven't gotten confirmation on why that even exists. But I guess I'm the get off my lawn person now. So in talking about all of these types of things, if it's a mistake that someone makes, the Twitch thing happened because Amazon's, um, their S3 bucket, the storage database essentially was left in a state that was public. And it's not easy to find, but there are people who, uh, one of my really close friends scours the internet looking for these things in a very special way and finds databases that have been misconfigured so that you can fix it. Now, this doesn't, the social engineering port, uh, part of it doesn't apply to that. That's just user error. Typically what we're seeing, this applies to spam email, phishing, phone calls, text messages, anything that's uh, Nigerian prince related, that kind of thing. It's someone lying to you, carrying a gas can, pretending to be out of gas just to get sympathy, walking with a limp and pretending to have crutches. Not saying everyone is pretending, but there are people who are. It's a grift. It's a scam. It is a way to get you to part with information that you wouldn't normally give to somebody if they were being honest. So you identify your targets. You gather as much information uh, when you're doing like background reconnaissance, you, you case the joint essentially. Man, I could not have sounded whiter right there. Select your attack methods. That's when you engage with your target. You come up with a pretext, a lie that you're gonna, you're gonna go with. Um, you won the lottery, whatever the case may be. The better you anticipate and the better your research, the more likelihood of success there's going to be. Eric, there's a reason I know you're from Akron or have, have some association with that. And I'll talk to you after the webinar, but not to just totally disrupt your mood for the next 45 minutes, but I think it's funny. Um, when doing background checks or doing information gathering, there are a million different ways you can go about it. We all know we have Facebook permissions, permissions for our friends lists or posts and things like, it's kind of like that, but then we don't always realize what our Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter, and we forgot about our MySpace and MySpace might not have pulled the metadata out of, or the EXIF data out of a photo. So it might have location information and it, depending on when your phone GPS crossover happened if you were still using MySpace or you still hadn't gotten the memo. It's, there's a million different places to look. I did a conference uh, in Park City, Utah, and that's where I got the football uh, from Steve Young. The two guys who booked me before I had been booked to speak, they're like, so we want to know what you're going to talk about we'll have a meeting in a week. So I did as much recon on them as I possibly could. Turns out one of the guys is best friends and they're both long distance super runners. I, I don't even understand that at all. Uh, like hundred mile runs, it's just insane. And his, that guy lives in the neighborhood with really close friends of mine. So on Facebook, there he's a friend of a friend. And it just immediately opened up a whole bunch of information. And then I was able to find out, oh, he's a runner. Oh, he has uh, this running app. Oh, wow. I can tell when he travels because he's always going back to this hotel on his GPS route. 
And then he comes back and he goes on a run after meetings, but he lives over here. All right, that's where his home address is. Who owns his lien on his house? Where, what bank does he bank with? And then the other guy, I was able to find out his wife is a registered Republican and he's an independent. So I asked him, I was like, is it a problem in your house that your, your wife's Republican and you're an independent? And he goes, not really. My wife's very opinionated. <laughs> that was his only response. And then they said, okay, we'd like to hire you. So it was a, there could have been a, a negative response to me knowing that amount of information but it was all sourced and clearly identified. Like this is stuff that you might wanna not do. Currently, the Russian soldiers who looted houses for Apple AirPods are being tracked with the Find My AirPods thing through the, other, the actual victim's iPhone. So they're able to track Russian troop movements as to who just robbed them. Like if there was any better thing, it's like, you know, the soldier who just pillaged your house? There he is. Like, we're supposed to be getting better at warfare, not like arguably worse. Like that's, that is a huge problem. There are people also tracking them on Grindr and Tinder, uh, even though there are no gay people in Russia, according to uh, the Russian government. It's illegal to be. All of this uh, background information is usually used to target executives. And this is what this group does. There's a, a journalist named Brian Krebs. He runs a website called Krebs on Security. He wrote a, a blog about this recently. He's a friend of mine and his, uh, the. The technical term is advanced persistent threat, APT. And his joke was advanced persistent teenagers because seven or eight of them were arrested and they're all between the ages of like 15 and 18. I mean, they don't have kids, they have no jobs, they live at home, they have all the time in the world to be the best at their craft. And they're probably as awkward as I am at talking to women. So they're probably pretty good at computers. Microsoft has been tracking them for quite a long time. And I think someone's a Star Trek fan. The reason I say that is Lapsus is the name they give them or they give themselves and Dev0537 is what Microsoft assigned them as a, a group. So they're a numbered, not a named group, which is a reference, I think, to a alien species from another dimension that the Borg and the Federation goes and fights in Star Trek Voyager. And I'm losing everybody because super nerd. I wanna apologize for liking that. So they use social engineering tactics and they're getting pretty clever. One of the things that they're doing is they'll buy credentials steal credentials, but they don't have the MFA token. They don't have this piece that makes you go allow or deny. Now, if I forget that I'm connected to my work VPN, after about an hour, it'll try to reconnect and it'll send me a prompt. And I might be upstairs, but I, I'm going back downstairs. I don't want to reconnect, so I'll just go allow. Now that's the problem because you're not sitting at your computer. And if, if any, uh, like if your company happened to use Microsoft uh, or Office 365, which I know you do, um, you would know that if you sign into Office 365 and you do the MFA prompt through the app, it doesn't say allow or deny. It gives you numbered prompts, which force you to have to look at the screen and match which option it is. This is better than text messaging, but what these guys figured out that on VPNs for Cisco and other things, people use Duo or other MFA providers that don't do the numbered option. So they'll, in the middle of the night, click send notification over and over and over. And can you imagine it's 3.30 in the morning and your baby just got to sleep and your phone's beeping like crazy? 
and the only way to make it go away is to click allow. If the number is more than zero as to how many people actually did it, which is how they were able to, it's so stupid. It's a genius move. And that's one of the, my, uh, Microsoft's recommendations is don't use, hey, don't use text messaging. And then don't use a service that requires the allow deny. You have to be sitting at the computer screen when you're trying to log in because then it says, okay, push 80 on your phone to confirm. It seems very similar, but the functionality is very different. So part of this process, they need to get credentials. They buy them on the dark, dark web, or they will uh, put a password stealing malware somewhere in a file and people will download it passively. It's very difficult to get someone to click on a link reliably, to be able to get them to actually fall for a direct attack, to get them to download. People have antivirus, it gets caught all the time. Gmail's really good about that. So they've taken to other, other tactics. And for those who don't know about the whole process about credentials, every company in the world is a target. And every time one of those companies gets breached, the database of connected users who've ever connected, who've ever signed up as a member, they find the identity portion of the database and they download it. So now they've got all these usernames and passwords. Sometimes they're encrypted or um, hopefully they're encrypted and a whole bunch of other data. So then they go and try to use those credentials to find out which ones have MFA prompts and which ones don't. And they separate those out. Now they have a whole pile of idiots and then a whole pile of almost idiots. <laughs> Would be potential idiots because if they have no way of doing your MFA, it doesn't matter. They can't log in, usually. That's a whole other level of work. So they're going to focus on the ones that aren't requiring that app prompt or the SIM card. Unless you're a really high-value target, then they can do things like SIM swapping, where they call the phone company and pretend to be another phone provider, and they do a SIM swap where they provision a new SIM card for your account without authorization, and suddenly your phone stopped working. And it says no service. And that's when they sign into your Bank of America because it's gonna check your phone number or it'll call you, but they're calling the guy, not you. And those are usually, those types of things started happening when people started having crypto accounts in the cloud. It's always about it's, it's always about the crypto. Like that's really because you can't steal checking account money easily. It's a huge hassle. A few years ago, you had to send in a notarized letter to a bank or bring it in and sign actual paperwork before they'd allow you to make wire transfers from your account. Now you have Zelle and you can just da -da, done. PayPal, Cash App, Venmo, PayPal. Like it's just a million different options now. And back in the day, it was super hard. So this simplifies a little bit. I like this graphic a little bit better. I don't know if that's a rocket or a, is he a Pope? Is he wearing a Pope hat or I don't know. Comments are welcome as to what you think that is. Maybe we should do a new poll. What do you think? Of it? I see a, I see a <clears throat> elite hacker with a hoodie on. That's what I see. Or Oh, I guess it automatically unmutes people or mutes people. I don't know. Did I get muted? Yeah. Yeah, it muted you. DEF CON. Someone hoodie. with a DEF CON hoodie. <laughs> it yeah. could I be saw that the or rocket. that. I see the rocket still, and then I yeah. see the laptop, but the laptop's backwards because yeah. the bottom part is too big. You know what yeah. it reminds me of? It reminds me of the creature in The Incredibles. Remember that um, that that evil robot with the eye? Yeah, and it had those tentacles coming out of it. I don't know. That's the first thing that big came ball. Yeah, the big yeah. ball. That's right. Yeah. 
I definitely see every, that one. Every time I get in a Corolla, I'm six five with shoes on and like 265, I feel like Mr. Incredible. Or if I have to ride in an economy. You don't have the suit, do you? Good. A super suit? No, I do not. So there's now, there's password stealing software of many varieties, ransomware of many varieties, whole marketplace is dedicated and they have graphics. Like it's people are putting in effort and they're turning into software companies for the for the underworld. Once they've got those types of credentials using these variety of methods, the other side of this is kind of this is the freakiest part about it is they're literally recruiting on Telegram, offering up to twenty thousand dollars a week for an employee of a telecom provider or a Fortune one hundred company to install go to meeting or um, log me in or some type of remote control software into a company and just walk away. They're sharing the profits with a insider threat. I don't know what the number would be for most people to finally go, you know what, I think so. But with the amount of Me Too stuff and the amount of just really crappy bosses there are, I know a lot of people would be like, $20,000 a week? You can have my firstborn and second. Like, it, it's not a small amount of money. And it really preys upon oh, so many things. So they're, it, it's working. These guys are millionaires, or at least were. Once they have their credentials, they'll try VPNs, remote desktop, terminal servers, Citrix servers, load balancers, routers, you name it. And once you have, oh, I've got a few pieces of credential. Okay, cool. I can go on LinkedIn. I can search name company. All right, he's a VP. Cool. I can then go and figure out what name I need to look for to go for the IT admin, the senior guy, because his title says senior or architect or chief, it's really easy you to go find them. And then you go and look through your breach data and oh, bam, there it is. And then if you can trick it or somehow manage to get in, you now have a super user account. And depending on what your configuration is, it might be game over. Social engineering tactics, these are some of the the ways that they trick you. So if, or something to be uh, cautious about, you get a weird text message, or I get at least one a day on Facebook Messenger right now, it goes, hi, how are you? And it's a friend I recognize, the picture and the name, but it's not someone who would go, hi, how are you? That's just not how they talk. Like, hey man, I was just see, I, you know, I wanted to catch up or whatever, but I know where the context of most of my conversations are. So if you know that this is coming, like, all of the friend requests I get are suddenly cheerleaders. I didn't become good looking overnight, so that wasn't it. There's no way a whole slew of beautiful women are suddenly wanting to be friends. It's not. It's going to be, look at how many friends they have, look at their timeline. Maybe, just maybe you'll get lucky and you'll look down the timeline and go, huh, that's a dude. Like his original profile picture, he hadn't taken off his timeline. And then you change the name and change the profile picture, change the location, added some details. Scamming works and they're winning. If they can prey on an emotional button, they're, it's, it's because of child trafficking. They're trying to take away our guns. They're trying to take away our food. They're coming to kill us. They're invading the northern border, whatever. It's, it's designed to manipulate you. And there's urgency. And then it's convenient. Or it, if it feels too good to be true, it is. No one gives away free money. It doesn't work that way. If you get an investment opportunity that's going to double your money in a week, they wouldn't tell you. They would be making so much money they wouldn't need to advertise, they'd be living on a boat. They're not generous. 
no one's that generous. If they were, they'd be giving that formula to nonprofits. They wouldn't just be giving it to Joe Schmo because most people who win the lottery try to kill themselves or go bankrupt. The amount of people who die once they win the lottery is staggering. Money does not fix everything. Instant money fixes even less. If they refuse to prove their identity, getting on the phone, FaceTime, Skype, Teams, WebEx, Zoom, there's a million options. You need to voice verify something like wire transfer changes, accounting changes, major purchases. Those are good policies to have. And before I do the solution stuff, there was a couple things in Microsoft's report. <laughs> I, I actually paused and I was almost in awe. After the, the just the ballsiness of going, I'm just gonna click it until <laughs> they're so sick of it, they're gonna allow it just to make it go away, not realizing what they're doing. They would target an individual's personal email. Once they found out, Eric, you work at 7Signal, they're gonna go look for your personal email address because your home infrastructure is probably not as secure as your work. So they're gonna to try to get in that way, sending some, or some, maybe your wife. I, I wanna bet with Steve Young that I knew where he lived because he paid someone to hide his house in an LLC. But I found out where he, I could tell him his license plate number and I could tell him he just bought a brand new red Tesla but he still had the white minivan. And he goes, how'd you know that? I said, because the guy who did all the scrubbing of your background didn't do your wife. I mean, didn't scrub your wife's information. And he laughed and he goes, wow, but he was really good. And I goes, yeah, he was pretty good. He just wasn't great. That's what you need to think about. You need to go for all those different things. They would go after your mobile phone to do the second, to do the SIM swap. And then they can get into your computer or your browser and then get your saved credentials in your browser because you probably did that because your browser is as insistent as mine. Like, you sure? You should just save it here. It's so much easier than writing. Save it. Go. Save it. It'll be perfect. Once they got access, they could advertise within the company. And there was one thing. They even were able to change passwords and register with the company's support company. So they would get help or resetting passwords, pretending to be an employee, even taking it as far as they got into Azure, they locked out all the other global administrators, routed all the mail for the domain to this one new email account, basically locking them out of everything because you couldn't get password resets and the DNS records had all changed. Then they deleted all the VMs temporarily. And then what they did, they got on the incident response call to find out what the incident response would actually be and who they were gonna use and what company it was and who was in charge and listen and record it and then documented it all. And I, I, I'm just, that's just, take them away. But still like you kinda, that's, <laughs> Who does that? And I've done some dumb stuff. Everything within the company, they'd go after Jira databases, GitLab, Confluence, code repositories for lazy coders who left credentials in code instead of using a variable, like Power, PowerShell has encrypted variables that you can substitute for passwords. That way you don't have passwords sitting around in plain text. It's a hassle, but is it worth it? Yeah, they called an organization's help desk using all the information they've gathered about Eric and then hired a native English speaker, American, because none of them are American, which is a huge red flag when 
Hello, sir. Thank you. I'm Carl. You're, like, you're not Carl. I, you just say you're Kumar. I don't care. But just it belies what bothers me. Like they made you pick Bank of America. You, did you make him pick an American name? That's shame on you. That's just not cool. You can't fake an accent well. Most people can't. So they hired a, a voice actor. That's taking it to extremes. And they had the mother's maiden name. They had the street they grew up on. They had everything. They couldn't, they didn't answer anything wrong and they got access. Once they have the access, they'll pull all the data they can, whether it's, okay, we can sell this or we can use this and sell it, or we can use this to gain access to other things to get crypto. One way, shape or form, they're gaining more ground than they're losing. There are, I've got at least 15 to 20 of these. There's probably a hundred best practices for Azure AD, um, hybrid ADFS, depending on what the scenario is, if you're all in cloud or you're some local, some in cloud, depending on the configuration, but no more MFA exclusions for trusted locations. Bad idea. Hassle? Yes. Don't care what you think. Sorry, CFO. You don't get special privileges. You go ahead and justify it to the board or our auditor. They'll agree with me. I did my homework. You just don't want to do something. That should trump everything. Instead of using all passwords or all the MFA options, YubiKeys, um, those are really, really good, along with uh, putting it in a fire safe with an account that's breaking case of glass, restore, recover accounts. Uh, for individuals, if I know your cell phone number by heart, because I memorize it or whatever, and I need bail, I also know how to get your password recovery options for your banking or your Gmail, because you probably use that phone number, unless you use a special burner number or like an app that has a number in it that no one else knows you have, and that's the only sole purpose for it is just unlocking that one account because if they don't know that number, they can't steal the SIM card. And no, no one's gonna tell them what the number is. Never use SMS messages or text messages if possible. If that's the only option, you probably don't wanna use that provider for whatever they're offering because it's not 1995 or 2005 or whatever it is. SMS is really insecure. Feels very bad about itself. Backup super admin accounts stored in a fire safe, along with backups, hard drives that get plugged in, all the data transfers over, you unplug it and you put it away. Pull backups once a week, that kind of thing. Never store your work credentials in a browser. If you don't have AppLocker, configured, please, whoever's in charge of that, give him space. Don't make him do a whole bunch of other tickets. This is more, this is a higher priority. This allows you to lock down all of the apps in existence with just one click and then go, these are okay. Instead of default allow everything, and then you have to block certain things, everything is blocked. And then you go notepad, word, VPN, email, PowerPoint, pinball, whatever. And then if someone downloads a virus because they were trying to find Anna Kornikova's new tape, oh, sorry, didn't work. It's not on the approved list. It'd be weird if it was. Advanced monitoring solutions, solar winds. Yes, I, for anybody who knows that SolarWinds got hacked a while back, yes, they did a really good job. They are a partner of Spire Solutions as well as Manage Engine. There's a whole other company. They also have a whole bunch of AD tools that I recommend. I actually do webinars for them in Africa and the Middle East once a month now. They have an amazing product suite, like too many products. AD managers, 
auditing, log auditing, monitoring, user trends, the works, more than you'll ever use. But it gives you the ability to run more things with one person, more patching, more just everything that's needed in an ops or management environment. SolarWinds Manage Engine, either one. You want to event monitor, incident monitor, automated, so you can detect certain things. Um, at the end of this article that I downloaded from Microsoft and reworded to kind of give you the background on the, the hackers, there's solutions that are even way more technical that are actual XML files for how to detect Nord VPN sign-ins through Azure Sentinel. So being able to tweak to figure out where connections are coming from and go, okay, Eric, for example, it has risky sign-ins because he, he was in Dallas yesterday and now he's in Tahiti. That doesn't check because he couldn't have traveled 8,000 miles in 45 minutes. Huh, okay, that's probably not okay. So they check, they have all sorts of different helpful customizations for Defender 365, uh, Azure Sentinel, Azure AD, everything to be able to hone in on this group and then other ones as well. So it gives administrators a lot of customization options that are not automatically turned on by default. Immutable backups means you write it and then it's set in stone and it can't be modified. That's a really good thing because ransomware tries to take and kill the backups because they're just dicks like that. Like that's just really, that's just mean. MFA service with the number matching as I talked about instead of allow or deny. If you guys are already using Office 365, you're already one step ahead. Backup super admin accounts. Oh, administrators need dual credentials. So Eric Camuli would be E Camuli or the full name or whatever. So if I try to guess that I have privileges with your credentials, I'd be wrong. The way Microsoft does it is A dash. They use an A dash username account separate. So you're never logged in as that user. But if you elevate your privileges to be able to run something, like I try to install a program and he goes, are you an administrator? Please type in your credentials. Microsoft makes you put in a physical card with a smart chip into a reader, put in your admin creds, and then you still have to go through an approval process to justify what you're trying to do. Now that's a much more sophisticated scenario, but if you just have that admin account that you're not signed in as, it's not automatically going to run the virus thing that you misclicked because you were too busy worrying about what's going on with your divorce and, or I screwed up in the golf game and now we missed tea time and you click on the wrong thing. We make mistakes. It shouldn't be instant death because, uh oh, looks like you, uh, you crossed the white line. We're going to kill you now. That's just not the way you need to live. That'd be, it'd be very, very stressful. Disable local admin on all machines or use what's called local admin password solution from Microsoft. It can be deployed through SCCM, PowerShell script, command line script, whatever, but it changes the admin password on every local machine. So if you built every machine the same off the same image, it's gonna have the same admin password. But if you use LAPS, it will actually put that username and password in Active Directory. So you can go look through users and computers and go find a specific computer to find out what the local admin password is. And you have to go look it up, but you can't, you didn't leave it around lying, lying around someplace. No one knows what it is until you have access to AD and go find it. And you can monitor that with an event monitor. Another way to do it is have a VM specifically for your admin purposes. So it's not always turned on. You power it up, type in your password, two-factor authentication, FIDO card, YubiKey or whatever. It, you do your business, you connect to the VPN. It's hyper-secure, multiple checkpoints, kind of a pain in the butt. 
but you have to do change controls at most companies anyways. This is insurance that if everybody was in an open concept type office and one of you gets bit by a zombie, how many, how many of you guys are going to get bit if there are no doors between you and the new insider threat who's very hungry? Or he, does, he has a key card that only gives him access to his office and the break room. Everyone else is safe because he can't now spread willy-nilly. That's kind of the concept of you don't know who's going to be an insider threat. Maybe Jim accidentally downloaded something, or maybe Jim's disgruntled. Either way, it does, we can't determine his intention based on his face. I mean, it looks great with the new camera and everything, but he might be seething, or he might have just accidentally done it, or somebody did it to him, and he had no idea. So now we have to protect against all those circumstances regardless of how we feel about each other, we have to say, okay, nobody gets any rights. No one's having any trust. We'll just assume and only give everyone least privileges instead of all privileges because I'm too busy to possibly figure out what every granular level of permissions they need because it gets tedious. But what's really tedious is finding a new job when your company goes under. password length of 15 or more. There's math behind it. If you want to know the math, um, it's something like millions of years difference. Anything under nine is like your laptop or your iPhone could crack that in a few minutes. 15 or more is mathematically, it's going to take a while. Like the sun will go out before that happens. It doesn't have to be difficult to remember. It can be my dog hates riding in airplanes, or my dog is terrible at driving. I mean, it's fairly long, just off the top of my head. I love brand new carpet. Who doesn't? It doesn't even have to be upper or lower case. Add a number or two and you're good. Clean your room. Basically, that means clean up old, stale, useless things in Active Directory. Put them in a temporary, I'm going to delete this if no one says anything pending delete with the ability to restore it if you accidentally made a mistake. Uh, clean up uh, mailboxes, licenses, turn off people's access. HubSpot was breached because of an insider threat at 1.2 because somebody was disgruntled and had gotten fired, but they still had access to something. It happens all the time. Ashley Madison, big breach. Disgruntled employee, insider threat. Somebody was sexually harassing somebody and they weren't having any of it, or at least for not very long. Secure DNS services filters out a lot of malware as sort of a cloud collaborative effort of, hey, you got malware from that site. All right, we're going to mark it down. Iceberg over there, no more boats go that way. Thanks, Titanic. You don't want to be the, it's doing the same stupid thing everyone else did over and over again. So we can learn from each other's mistakes. So they filter out bad addresses. It keeps you from getting into all the trouble. Maybe not everything, but most of it. Someone has to be in charge of patching and updates just like finance. Otherwise, you won't have either. Audit C-level personnel, especially for social media, uh, potential exposure for home addresses. And there are ways of cleaning that stuff up. Uh, I'm actually starting a company with my, a, a friend of mine who discovered some of the biggest breaches in world history. Uh, and John Cleese's daughter is co-founding the company with us. Uh, she had a stalker at one point who tried to shoot and kill her outside of a comedy club and hit her friend. She's had three stalkers, three of them are in jail. Uh, several of her friends have all, all female have all experienced the same things. I've had several celebrity clients who may or may not have called somebody back after a date and then they got stalked for a whole bunch or their cars got bugged. So this is a service that not only celebrities, but C-levels become big targets. They want their information taken off white pages 
other directory and content sharing services limiting their exposure so that people can't go and find out that they like the Mets and that their favorite dog is a, a German shepherd and that their wife hates the Mets. So, you know, don't give them season tickets or don't use that as a, a potential phishing idea. The less information out there, the better. If you need help, find a forum, find a way to ask for help, but generalize. Be like, I work for a company in America. We have, we have more than one person and less than 5,000, and we are having problems with this. There are people who want to help. I know because I'm one of them. Or the best way I know to get help is to go on Reddit, post a, today I learned, and make a really stupid mistake in the title because people will give you the correction to that faster than you can find it. There's a whole law about it. So I think that's basically it. Awesome. And I have some possible live and recorded demos I'm going to be pitching to Heather later. Great. And there's this will all the links and things are going to be in a PDF later. Yep. Uh, yep. But it's uh, tools for finding out if you were in a data breach, finding out if your company was in a data breach, monitoring for future stuff, um, how to stay keep your purchases and private, you can get a unique debit card through privacy.com, new phone numbers through a company called MySudo. Proton VPN is the only VPN I know not to be compromised in any way, shape or form. And yes, that means the one you're thinking of. Proton VPN is the only one I trust and I don't get referrals or affiliate commissions. So at least there's that. All of these you'll have. And because I told you to, you can trust the links. Awesome. Well, we appreciate it, Brian. And uh, like you just heard, we'll share those links and uh, a lot of good tips and uh, and stories there. Always entertaining to uh, for you to be on with us. Well, I appreciate that. And I think up next, we've got Eric Kamuli with a, a brief seven minutes with seven signal today. Yeah. And, you know, I just saw one of those links, Brian, that said, you know, have I been pwned? And, you know, based upon some of your comments earlier, now you got me, uh, you know, concerned. So you're yeah. going to have to send me a note or something. <laughs> if, if, there was, if, if there was something that was an emergency, I think you could probably use your judgment that I would have contacted you immediately. Thank you for that. Nevertheless, I know that, um, you know, I've had some issues in the past that I am trying to clean up. And you're exactly right, Brian, you got to take active steps, you want to clean this stuff up. I know that, you know, now I'm starting to use Bitwarden, you know, it was always so inconvenient and annoying. But now I am trying to get into the habit and I'm using those 15 letter crazy passwords and just using the one password to, to, to rule them all to rule them all. Right. And I'm, I'm starting to put into practice the habits that you're uh, that you're trying to instill in us. And so I greatly appreciate that. Nevertheless, let's go on with seven minutes, of seven signal. I was in a system today and let me share my screen so I can show you what I'm seeing here. But I saw something when I was just kind of looking around some of our uh, devices here in seven signal mobile eye. And um, you should be able to see this now. And I was, I was looking at this here and this was really concerning me. Okay, so this is an apartment building, all right? So in this apartment building, as you can see, the internet service provider has basically just told, you know, basically handed out home routers to everybody in the building and they're all on the same channel. But you know what? There's one thing that's even a little bit worse. It looks like the default name of the network, check this out guys, look at all of the name, look at the names of the networks. They're all the same. And it just led me to believe, you know what, not this person here, they have their own unique name of their network here, as you can see over on the right side of your screen. But this is really concerning to me. And then I printed this out and then you could print this out and just look at it, Xfinity Wi-Fi, Xfinity, and then, you know, some unique ones in here, Xfinity, Xfinity, Xfinity Wi-Fi, over and over and over again. And it just led me to believe, it's like, wow, you know, is this not ripe for, you know, a man in the middle attack where somebody can just set up that SSID? I mean, everybody's got it and just kind of spoof somebody into putting in their password. 
Jim, have you ever, you know, yeah. you know, have you, I mean, just quickly what your comments are on, on what you're seeing here. That's a perfect SSID to use for a rogue AP, mm -hmm. Xfinity Wi-Fi. Spectrum has their own SSIDs they use for, for Passpoint. Mm -hmm. And uh, back in the day, it was ATT Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. In fact, you could get uh, like uh, phones from that the cellular provider sold would have um, a default SSID built in. So right out of the box, it was looking for that SSID. And if you put, your, put that in your rogue AP, you get all these association attempts. So... Yeah, right on. It is it is scary. And, you know, again, you know, unfortunately, we live in a world where we really have to raise our level of awareness. And based upon some of the lessons that we've been taught over the past uh, couple of months by Brian and others, you know, when I see something like this, immediately my suspicion, uh, you know, is raised. So that's what I wanted to share with you guys today. Thanks for thanks for coming out. And thanks, Brian, uh, for another great session. We appreciate it very much. And remember, guys, we can't see or hear Wi-Fi, but Seven Signal can. Thanks for joining us.